Dying Light really doesn't get the credit it truly deserves in my eyes. Many people tend to listen to just one video game review critic and just shun the whole game away, thinking it's a dead end in part 3. However, Techland has done many great things for this game, with a battle royale coming out that actually looks fun and interesting compared to the rest of the oversaturation that genres become, to making fun of other game developers by making DLC free for over a year just to prove a point and mock their greediness. And nothing comes close to the best DLC they ever released than Be The Zombie Mode. I feel not only is this the best DLC Techland has ever made, but it is heavily underappreciated. I feel a large part of that comes from the fact that people have one bad impression of the mode and they hate it, or are simply too ignorant of how it functions. However, with this guide, I hope to shed some UV light on this game mode and hope you are willing to give it a try. Or if you're a new person and you stumble across this video, hopefully you get the game and maybe we can play one day. Now this guide will be mainly focused on helping newer players or people who don't know how this game mode even works, but more experienced players should still give this a watch. I'll be covering almost everything there is to playing as a survivor in the wrong quarantine zone, and knowledge is a very crucial piece of weaponry when going to war, and the Night Hunter is no exception. Now what is the Night Hunter game mode? Night Hunter is a game mode in which random players who want to play as a Night Hunter can invade your game if you leave it open to the public. If you personally don't want to fight a Night Hunter often, or do under very specific circumstances, you can edit how frequent your game is going to be open to a Night Hunter, ranging from never, to at night, to all the time. Now what is the purpose of the Night Hunter game? Well, when a Night Hunter joins your game, you'll be notified that a player is trying to connect to your game. Once they have connected, the Night Hunter symbol will be in the middle of your screen, indicating an invasion is about to take place. This will only give you a few seconds to mentally prepare and organize your gear to fight this terrible monster. Night Hunter invasions can happen at almost any time if you leave it open so, and on all three maps. However, plot important missions and missions that take place inside will not allow a Night Hunter to join. Now the goal as a survivor is to destroy volatile nests. You'll need to destroy five volatile nests and the Night Hunter's job is to protect the nest at all costs. And I mean all costs. The Night Hunter is meant to be annoying, threatening, and a time waster. A Night Hunter will use any tool he has access to stop and kill you. While he only has 5 nests to defend, you only have 10 lives to win the game. While this sounds like a lot, playing brash, dumb, and stupid will drain those lives fast. And keep in mind, if you're playing with a team, the team collectively shares lives, meaning if you have 10 lives and your friend dies, you and the rest of your team will only have 9 lives to work with. Now what exactly is a Night Hunter? A Night Hunter is a glass cannon of a character, meaning he can do a lot of damage, However, he can be surprisingly killed easily if you know what you're doing. The Night Hunter's main attack is his pounce. It's a one-hit insta-kill. If the Night Hunter can wrap his tendrils around you, you're dead. Nothing can be done to save you. While this sounds broken, there's a catch to the Night Hunter. Similar to Volatiles, the Night Hunter is very sensitive to UV light. This is important because the Night Hunter has two bars, the top bar being his actual health and the bottom bar being his energy. Now if the Night Hunter doesn't have a full bar of stamina, he can never ever do his lethal pounce move. However, unless the stamina is truly drained, he'll have access to other abilities, mainly being tendril locomotion and tackling. Aside from lethally pouncing survivors, the Night Hunter has other abilities. Here's the general list of his other attack methods and how to counter them. Spits. Spits are used to help cause chaos and disorder among the survivors. Depending on the mutation of the Night Hunter, he may have access to other spits. His four spits are Horde Summoner. Horde Summoner is when a bunch of gas tank hazmat zombies in their Nightwalker form will appear on the map. They will run at the players under the effects of the spit and attempt to kamikaze them by blowing up near them. The main way to counter these bombers is by climbing up on the highest surface you can since they cannot climb. UV Suppressor. UV Suppressor is when your flashlight, your main defense against the Night Hunter, is rendered useless, and you'll need to forego a forced recharge. If you were in a UV flare and spit went off near it, the flare will be destroyed. To counter UV suppressor, throw a flare down ASAP, or have teammates close to flashlight the Night Hunter. Survivor Sense Suppressor This is a spit unlocked at a tier 1 or greater mutation. This is when your ability to track the Night Hunter via your minimap will be rendered useless. You also cannot see the distances of other players, nests, and safe zones. This spit will last 5 minutes, and you'll need to rely on the tracking down Night Hunter by your own skills, and you'll have to slow your game down to make sure that you're not going to be pounced. 
Note the threatening music changes to signal that he's near, and listen to the Night Hunter himself. He is a very noisy and nasty creature, and that can help you counter his spit. Toxin spit. An ability unlocked at a tier 2 mutation or better, this is when the Night Hunter will carpet bomb an area with a highly toxic patch of goo that will do damage over time to people who stand in it. Simply avoid the spit as often as you can. Ground Pound. This is when the Night Hunter will raise his fists into the air and slam them into the ground, causing a rumble near him. Try to predict when the Night Hunter will ground pound, and avoid being in the radius as best you can. If the Night Hunter doesn't hit a human in the ground pound radius, he'll be stuck in place trying to recover, and this will be a great opportunity to strike. Also know that the ground pound will disable all nearby flares. Do not stack flares on top of each other, this will destroy both of them. A form of ground pounding is spit smashing where the Night Hunter will use two charged up spits and smash them into the ground, coating any survivor that was hit with the radius. This can apply to any of the four spits he has access to. It's not commonly used, but you still need to watch out for it. A ground pound knocking you into spikes will also kill you. Be very careful of this. UV Blocking UV Blocking is an ability to block your UV lights for a limited amount of time. This is typically used to either escape having his energy completely drained or as a means to save his energy and try to pounce a human at a weird angle. UV Healing This is a tier 3 mutation skill where the Night Hunter will stay in place for about a second and regen all of his stamina and health. This is often used to keep up the pressure of a fight or as a surprise attack on a survivor who was not expecting it. This is best countered by swift action of either preparing for a sudden pounce or wailing into the Night Hunter in an attempt to interrupt his healing process. Tackling Tackling is a very common attack because it does decent damage and is easily spammable. If a Night Hunter has any energy in him, he can run, and this can be used to ram into a survivor. The best way to counter this is to always make sure you're facing the Night Hunter and try to drain his stamina down as often as you can and follow his movements by hitting a direction key and spacebar at the same time when you think the Night Hunter will be moving in for a tackle. Keep in mind this move is very spammable by both new and veteran Night Hunters. As long as the Night Hunter is running, he has the ability to tackle, even at stupid angles and elevations. The Night Hunter can also use environmental dangers such as spikes to his advantage. If tackled into spikes, he will insta-kill a human. Scratching Scratching is a simple attack that will do about 20% of a human's health. While not strong, it's used to chip away or down and kill a wounded human. Avoid being in close proximity with a Night Hunter who likes to scratch. Scratching is also more powerful with larger teams because the Night Hunter can take more blows from one person. Leapfrog Leapfrog is an ability that if a survivor gets pounced, the Night Hunter can bounce between survivors and keep lethal pouncing going. If survivors are panicking, don't have UV gear available, or are just generally clueless, they can suffer two or more deaths from an unexpected attack. Now that we went over the basic attacks that Night Hunter will perform, now it's time to gear up and fight this undead bastard. As a prerequisite, if you want to play Night Hunter matches, I urge you at the very least, and I mean bare bones, have level 12 survivor rank. This is because you'll have access to the grappling hook, one of the most important tools you can have at your disposal and will let you traverse the map the quickest. These three other pieces of equipment are mandatory. Do not play Night Hunter without these pieces of equipment, unless, you know, you're just fucking around. A UV flashlight and flares, preferably Zaid flares. A UV flashlight is mandatory because how else are you going to hinder the fucking Night Hunter? Flares are also needed because they're a backup in case the UV flashlight becomes disabled or it needs to recharge. Zaid flares are much preferable because they burn longer and have a larger radius than normal GRE flares. The third piece of equipment is medkits. Lots and lots and lots of medkits. You can never have enough medkits. Ideally, you want to have at least 100 plus medkits crafted. The Night Hunter will hurt you at any moment he can get to you, and when you have a moment to heal, you should do it. It's a habit you'll need to develop when fighting Night Hunters. There are many other ways to die aside from his lethal one-hit kill moves. Take precautions. Now, a grappling hook, a UV flashlight, and flares are undeniably required to fight the Night Hunter. This will leave you open with one other piece of equipment to use at your disposal. I will go over a few pieces of equipment that you can use. 
These mainly focus on how you play the game and the scenario you're up against when you're fighting a Night Hunter. Not all pieces of equipment will be covered. If an item is left off the list, it's most likely due to it either being extremely situational or just plain useless when fighting a Night Hunter. Firecrackers Firecrackers are a piece of equipment that will be used as a passive tool. They're mainly used to distract feral biters at nests so you can attack volatile nests in relative peace, but more importantly, they can be used to distract bomber zombies. Keep in mind that the zombies themselves need to be close to the firecrackers, otherwise they'll just ignore them and go straight for you. Stay in the relative area of the firecrackers when they're going off if you can't get to a high place. This might save your life if you're hit with a horde spit. Shields Shields are good for two things, but one is arguably more important. You can block minor Night Hunter attacks like scratches if they like to spam that, but the main purpose is to block spits from sticking to you. As long as you aren't stuck with the spit physically, or you're f and you're facing the general direction of where the spit is going to be and you have your shield equipped and out, you can actually block the spit from affecting you. Keep in mind that the shield will leave you vulnerable to attacks when it's out and deployed, specifically tackles. Potions While there's quite a few potions to use in Dying Light, there's only four that really matter for fighting Night Hunters. Night Hunter Boosters, Damage Resistance Potions, Speed Boost Potions, and Cloak Potions. Night Hunter Boosters are what you can create after you get Night Hunter Glands from fighting Night Hunter games sometimes. They essentially function as an all-in-one kind of potion, with extra speed, damage resistance, and the extra effect of dealing slightly more damage to Night Hunters. Damage Resistance Boosters can help block a certain percentage of attacks dealt by the Night Hunter, Good for hunters who like to spam scratching and tackling. Speed boost potions are good for hauling ass. If you need to traverse extra fast to a nest, or say you need to catch up to your team, a speed booster is the way to go. Cloak potions, however, are arguably the best potions of the bunch. Camouflaging you will confuse the night hunter. Since the night hunter will always know where you are, with the exception of camouflage, it's not a bad choice. Camouflage and cloak potions will conceal your position to the last known spot you were at to the night hunter as long as you don't make a, a direct line of sight to him, however. Normal camo is where you smear guts from zombie corpses, and a cloak potion is a consumable that you drink. Obviously, normal camouflage will last longer than a cloak potion. However, a cloak potion is an on-the-spot remedy. Camo can also stop bombers from chasing you. Keep in mind, camouflage can be wiped off if a night hunter injures you, or if you fall into a body of water. A final note about potions is that all potions will be on a MASSIVE cooldown after consuming one. Use them accordingly, please. Mines If you have the following DLC, mines are an item you can acquire and craft. Mines are typically used in an extremely portable explosive tank. There's two purposes of using mines. Laying traps for night hunters and making a pile of them around a vault nest only for a night walker to detonate them. While easily avoided, mines are very rarely used and this can often catch a night hunter off guard, dealing massive damage to him. It takes about three mines to kill a night hunter when fighting him one versus one, and they will do less damage to more people on your team. However, keep in mind, mines can cause friendly fire and down unaware friendlies. Mines are a very rare item used in night hunter games, and they're best used as a wild card. Please treat them and use them as such. Grenades. To me, grenades only have one purpose, to clear out a massive Nightwalker horde or goons around a vault nest. While explosions are dangerous against a Night Hunter, they're very unreliable and the Night Hunter can see a warning sign of an explosion coming his way. Grenades are best used against a Nightwalker horde with a survivor team of three or more due to how big and dangerous a Night Horde can become around nests, and Molotovs are a much weaker version of grenades. Throwing Stars Throwing stars are also a very niche tool that you can use. The only ones that will even make a lick of a difference would be exploding and freezing stars. Exploding stars will explode on whatever enemy it's stuck to, good for picking off stray night walkers. And freezing stars will keep goons from moving in on you if you're attacking a nest. Aside from those specific uses, please stay away from them. Flammable and conducting liquid. Another niche item. These are only good for stunning a massive Nightwalker horde or hitting a vault nest with an elemental effect. These are a much safer version of grenades and needs to be used with a weapon with said elemental effect on it to even function. However, unless you have a major problem with Nightwalker hordes, and I mean really terrible, 
This isn't really a good option to use. Pretty much the worst option, really. Now that we have the proper kit, it's time to talk about weapons. I'll be covering the main quote unquote categories of them. One-handed weapons, two-handed weapons, knives, firearms, the crossbow, and normal bows and arrows. Now before I go on, no matter what weapon you use, no matter how much damage it says it does, no matter what elemental effect applied to it, no matter how rare the weapon is, no matter how many legendary damage multipliers you have on it, no matter how many king mods you have on the weapon, it will always do the same amount of damage to the Night Hunter. The damage that is not affected by client side factors. A simple lead pipe will do as much damage to a Night Hunter as a gold wrench with a 2000 base damage will. However, the factors that will affect damage are what kind of weapon you're using, i.e. a one-handed, two-handed, etc. How many teammates are you with, the range, and if the swing was a normal swing or a heavy swing. That's it. Now there are what I like to call weapon categories. I'll explain what each of these mean, starting with one-handed weapons. One-handed weapons are any weapon you could swing with one hand. Simple enough, a lead pipe, a baseball bat, a machete, crowbar, kopesh, katana, anything that is held and swung with one hand. If you don't know if it's a one-handed weapon, test to see if you can death from above a zombie with it. If you can, it's a one-handed weapon. A one-handed weapon needs to be in your arsenal. It does consistent damage to both night hunters and nests. Always keep one on you. Now, one-handed weapons have different ranges. There's pluses and minuses to these. You have small, medium, and long-range weapons. Small-range weapons like hammers, pipes, hatchets, and wrenches have small ranges, meaning that they'll need to be closer to your target to deal the most amount of damage. However, they swing faster and are less prone to being caught on a wall when swinging. Dying lights can sometimes lock your weapons into a wall if it has a large swing radius, and this could be troublesome. Next, you have medium-range weapons, stuff like crowbars, machetes, and sickles. They have medium range and medium swing rates, you know, a nice middle ground for one-handed weapons. Finally, you have long-range weapons, things like katanas, swords, and baseball bats. These have the largest reach of any one-handed weapon, but they take a bit of time to swing. Honestly, you need to have a one-handed weapon. Ranging and swing speed is a personal preference, really. A final note is that throwing your weapon at a night hunter, while being risky, can really pay off. It will deal twice the amount of damage of one swing with it, and if you can land a hit. But you also lose the risk of losing the weapon. Use cautionly. Now two-handed weapons. All two-handed weapons function the same. At the cost of being slower to swing than any one-handed weapon, a two-handed weapon will deal twice as much damage as a one-handed weapon would. This is great for comboing attacks together, especially with a one-handed weapon. Also, two-handed weapons are more common on teams of survivors because teams individually do less damage to night hunters, but a two-handed weapon will still dish out some serious pain. Also, throwing a two-handed weapon is an option. It takes longer to prep a two-handed weapon to be thrown, and it's thrown entirely different than a one-handed weapon. However, it is really powerful. In fact, it is so powerful that you can one-hit kill a Night Hunter with a throw two-handed weapon if you're fighting him solo. Knives are another weapon of choice. Knives only have two purposes, really. Destroying volatile nests really fast, and as a backup death from above attack option. However, knives should mainly only be used to destroy nests. If pressed up against a target and crouching, you'll swing your knife really fast. This will burn through the health of volatile nests and nightwalkers. This tactic is best used when the night hunter is either dead or not paying attention to you. Otherwise, you're going to be fighting off a pissed off night hunter and you only have a puny little knife out. While it is possible to kill a night hunter with a knife, and I've done it a few times myself, the only scenario you should use a knife is either when the night hunter missed a ground pound or is caught in a confined area and he can't escape to recuperate his health. Otherwise, use the knife as a tool to destroy volatile nests and not as a weapon. Firearms are another choice to use. Before I go on, you must note that firearms are the weakest weapons, you know, nerf-wise, when used against a Night Hunter. For balancing purposes, all firearms deal the least amount of damage compared to what they normally would do in a normal game. However, you should not disregard firearms altogether. While there's only a few firearms in the game, the only ones you should really concern yourself with are pistols, SMGs, military rifles, double barrel shotguns, and the semi-auto shotgun. The pistol is a fairly consistent source of damage if you can land your shots, 
Nothing amazing, but it will do more damage per shot than any rifle. The military rifle is the rifle you should use over the police rifle due to it being fully automatic and having 10 extra bullets in the magazine. The military rifle is best used to try and gun down a severely wounded night hunter. Hitting them with even one bullet will interrupt this healing process, or even kill him if he's running away. The final firearms you should even consider using are the double barrel shotgun or the semi-auto shotgun. Both the double barrel and the semi-auto shotgun have the same stats, assuming the double barrel is golden. Meaning if you have access to the semi-auto, use it over the double barrel. The shotgun's main purpose is to deal decent damage to a night hunter in close range or to kill goons defending nests rather quickly. Finally, there are SMGs. SMGs are a hybrid of the pistols and the military rifle. It has the largest magazine in the game, shoots fast and accurately. The only downside is ammo is more scarce than any other forms of ammo in the game. The crossbow is a great weapon to have. If you have the following DLC, I highly recommend you include the crossbow in your arsenal. The crossbow does decent damage to vault nests. Great if you want to damage nests and you're being up high to avoid borrow hordes or acid spit. And it's also great for damaging night hunters. While the crossbow has four types of bolts, the two you should really only focus on are regular bolts and crossbow bolts. Regular bolts for are just plain damage, and toxic bolts are for applying a toxic effects to nests and briefly hindering the night hunter's healing process. If you hit a night hunter with a toxic bolt, it'll slowly decrease the night hunter's health by 13 and it will take longer for the night hunter to heal. The bow is in a similar situation for the crossbow, however, there are a few differences. Bows will do more damage to night hunters actually, and they have access to different types of projectiles. Bows, however, do not do as much damage as a crossbow bolt to a volatile nest, and you'll need to pull the bow back fully in order to fire the arrow. It's also not bad to use electric, explosive, or fire bows on volatile nests. A final addendum for weapons is weapon durability and elemental effects. During Night Hunter invasions, weapons will never degrade. No matter what you swing and attack it with, the weapons will never degrade. Also, if you're playing on the countryside, all buggies will never use gas or have their parts take damage. Finally, there's elemental effects. These only affect NPC zombies and the nests you need to kill. The effects you can add to a melee weapon are bleeding, freezing, toxic, fire, electricity, and impact. Out of all the elements to use, the only one that you really shouldn't use is bleeding. All other elemental effects will at least do something to evolve the nests, but I've never noticed bleeding does anything. Toxic is really good if you want to deal damage over time to a nest. Same with electricity and fire, however if you stand close enough to the volatile, you'll take damage. Freezing is seldom useful unless you want to freeze night walkers and it's on a knife or other weapon that attacks really fast. A thing to note is that during the last nest or the last human life, it will get darker and start to rain. When it starts to rain in dying light, all zombies become really good conductors of electricity and this can help keep night walkers off you by electrocuting them for several seconds. Impact isn't amazing unless paired with an electricity mod. For this reason, my personal preference is electricity on your one-handed weapon, then toxic or a knife with a toxic effect on it to help destroy nests really fast. Now that you're properly geared up, it's time to talk about some abilities you have as a human. These can help greatly if you want to fight the Night Hunter off with anything but weapons. Arguably the coolest and the flashiest is Death From Above. If you have this ability unlocked, you can Death From Above the Night Hunter. This is where you hold your mouse button down and you have a one-handed weapon out and you try to drop down from a big height on top of a Night Hunter. Keep in mind it takes a great height in order to deal Death From Above to a Night Hunter. However, if you can successfully death from above the Night Hunter, it'll always result in an insta-kill. Another ability you have is to drop kick the Night Hunter. If you run up to the Night Hunter and you successfully kick him with a drop kick, you and him will be locked into an animation where the Night Hunter will be brutally kicked away from you. It will deal a good portion of damage, and if the Night Hunter is behind spikes, you will impale him onto them, killing him. This logic also applies to avoiding a tackle. If you avoid his tackle, the Night Hunter will foolishly ram himself into spikes. This even applies to if you can shave off a Night Hunter when he's trying to pounce you. This is another ability humans can do. Well, I wouldn't call it an ability like an unlockable ability, but it's an ability you should need to know nonetheless. Being able to shake off a Night Hunter that's trying to pounce you. If you start to see tendril, weird looking tentacle things wrapping around you, the Night Hunter is pouncing you. 
you only have about one second to react before your fate is sealed. To stop the pounce, you need to shine a source of UV light in the Night Hunter's direction. This will cause him to fling off of you. If timed correctly and in the right place, this will fling the Night Hunter off into spikes resulting in an insta-kill. Another habit you should get into is dodging. Dodging is a good habit to get into, mainly for avoiding ground pound and spits. Dodging will also help keep your movement patterns varied, making sure that the Night Hunter has to keep track of your movement at all times. Rolling is something to also keep in mind. Rolling is an ability you unlock where you can survive a fall that would otherwise hurt you by hitting your crouch key before you hit the ground. This is good especially if you get knocked off a roof of a ground pound or a failed grappling hook or you are just simply careless. Keep in mind, Fatal Falls will still kill you. Now that we've covered the human aspect and all available tools, now it's time to talk about fighting the Night Hunter by yourself or with the team. What's better? There's positives and negatives to fighting the Night Hunter either solo or with the team. Really, it's gonna boil down to preference, really. However, I still want to note the differences for you because you should know them. When you fight a Night Hunter solo, you're on your own. Unless you have your game public, no one can help you. You'll need to fend for yourself. If you hit zero health, you will die. However, there's pluses to being on your own, mainly portraying the damage you can deal to Night Hunters and the power of your UV tools. Damage scales for humans against Night Hunters, meaning the more people on a survivor team, the less damage you can deal to them individually. If a Night Hunter misses a ground pound against a solo player, that means the survivor can most likely kill him because it'll only take three hits from a one-handed weapon to kill him. Also, your UV flashlight will affect the Night Hunter better. It will drain the Night Hunter's energy faster. You will also have access to two flares per recharge. This could be a lifesaver, making two portable save zones from the Night Hunter being your last chance of avoiding doom. The reason humans have a less powerful UV tools with more players on is that survivors should be cooperating with each other. UV lighting the Night Hunter to protect the survivor with UV suppressant, heal others, fight volatile nests, etc. A final note is that more people on a survivor's team, the longer it will take for survivors to respawn if they die. This is meant to punish teams for not cooperating and keeping themselves together and healthy. While it might sound bad to play on a team, it's really not. There's always positives when working with a team. Obviously having people to rely on if you're being attacked is great. Also, as long as a human wasn't pounced or knocked into spikes, they won't actually immediately die. They will enter a bleed out state where, if they aren't picked up in 15 seconds, they will die. Keep in mind though, a night hunter can scratch a downed human, ending their life early. Also, the reward at the end of the game will be larger. The more people you are playing with, the more survivor points you will get at the end of the game. A maximum being 40k survivor points. Obviously, <laughs> you gotta win the game though. Eh, you ain't getting no participation trophy points here. Really, I feel you need to play against Night Hunters of all kinds of skill in both teams and by yourself. You need to know where your strengths and your weaknesses are. Are you more of a passive player, only going for nests and killing the hunter is a secondary objective for you? Do you be the supportive member of your team by picking them up, distracting hordes and other successful team related abilities, or are you the aggressive survivor? stopping it next to nothing to put a blade in the Night Hunter's skull. You need to figure out what you're good at and diverse yourself with a bunch of skills and hopefully with a team. Now the humans know how to play, but you need to know the environment you want to be in and how to get around. Whether it be the slums, old town, or the countryside, knowing the landscape is crucial. You never know when you're going to get a Night Hunter invasion, and you don't want to be caught with your pants down. Alas, I'm going to cover all three map locations, point out info about each, and some other miscellaneous tidbits. All maps can be played for Night Hunter, and really no map favors one side or the other collectively, so don't worry about things being too imbalanced. We start with the slums. The slums is the first map you'll unlock to fight the Night Hunter. The slums is a more packed and tight quarter for the most part, and you'll be fighting in the Night Hunter more face to face more often than the other two maps. Nests will generally be close together, meaning night walker hordes can actually kind of build up rather fast. A plus for survivors is that the slums has the largest count of safe houses for any survivors to recoup in. However, don't stay in the safe house too long, or you'll forfeit the match, resulting in a win for the hunter. Also beware of the hazards. Spike traps, explosive barrels, chemical spills, and any other dangers like this are everywhere. Note the possible nest locations, where the hazards are, 
and use them accordingly. Spikes are littered everywhere. Also, bombers are more dangerous here as there are next to no bodies of water or high buildings to escape up to for the most part. Overall, the slums are a war zone for both you and the Night Hunter, with at both nest locations favoring hunters and survivors. Now we enter Old Town. Generally loved by more experienced players, this is considered to be the most balanced map for hunters and survivors. However, that view is very subjective. Old Town has many more buildings, and most of them are huge. In fact, some nest locations may only be on a rooftop. While there's less safe houses for survivors to retreat to, there are many bodies of water throughout the map, often a temporary safe haven in case you're crippled with a spit or you need to escape getting pounced. Buildings, however, generally favor hunters, mainly due to the ability to knock players off of them, dealing huge fall damage on them for the most part. However, night hunters themselves need to keep in mind that they can be death from above really easily in the slums, since most buildings have more than enough height to pull it off. Also, night hunters have an easier time to retreat from a fight they can recover, because chasing a night hunter can be a pain, especially in an alley or having to jump between numerous buildings just to even catch up with his speed. Finally, we have the countryside. If you have the following DLC, you'll have access to a beautiful and large countryside to mess around in, and we mean this map is huge. Nests will often be over 450 yards apart, 400 meters, meaning that you'll most likely get around on your buggy. That's one of the biggest upsides for playing on the countryside, the buggy! The buggy is an amazing tool that almost all players will use. It's very rare to see players disregard buggies to fight night hunters. Buggies provide another element of gameplay for both hunters and survivors. Buggies are great for ramming into open vault nests, but more importantly, being a secondary lifeline to survivors. Aside from a vehicle, you can add upgrades to these buggies. Two buggy upgrades to help keep you going and save your skin. While there's more than two buggy upgrades, you can only have two active at one time, and I will go over the ones that you should only really even consider. The UV safe zone, the car alarm, mine dispenser, flamethrower, and electric cage. The UV safe zone will surround your buggy with a large radius of purifying UV light. Arguably the best unlock for Night Hunter invasions, this is great because this provides a third lifeline with your UV support. Next we look at car alarms. This is a great tool to help distract night walkers from you, but more importantly, bomber zombies. The car alarm is like firecrackers on steroids, going for a long time and having a large radius of effect. I highly recommend having car alarms on your vehicle and having this to be remotely activated to help get bomber zombies off your back. Bomber zombies can come at you from the middle of nowhere in the countryside, and if you're in a big field, this can often sign and seal your fate in blood. Next is the mine dispenser. This tool will allow you to plop a mine behind your buggy while driving in the hopes of blowing up whatever is following. While this sounds good to use, it's very situational. Unless the night hunter is running behind you perfectly, odds are you won't hit the night hunter with a mine. Next is the flamethrower. A niche piece of equipment you really shouldn't use is to attack night hunters. You will almost never hit a night hunter with enough flames to significantly hurt it. The only real use you should have of this is to ram a vault on nest, get out, activate the flamethrower, and have that destroy the volatile while you go attack another one. Finally, we have the electric cage. This will be best utilized if a night hunter latches onto your buggy and tries to mash you to death in it. This will do a bit of damage to the Night Hunter and also interrupt his process of hurting you. If you don't mind living without a car alarm, this would arguably be the next best thing to choose for your buggy upgrades. A few notes about the buggy is that the Night Hunter can also ground pound and tackle the buggy. This will be used to try and flip your buggy, forcing you to get out. Be wary of Night Hunters trying to flip your buggy. Not only will this knock you off your path, but if you have a piece of equipment active and he pounds the buggy, it will immediately turn off whatever is being used by the buggy. Also note that you don't have to get out of your buggy as soon as the night hunter latches on. Your best bet would be to try and ram your buggy into anything going fast, a wall, a tree, another car, etc. This will violently force the night hunter off the car. Also note if you ram the night hunter into spikes on a post, like the ones by the train tracks, they will instantly kill them. Finally we get to wrap up the countryside as a map. While you may think humans having access to an amazing buggy would mean it's human-sided, you'd be wrong. 
The Night Hunter has a few trips off his sleeve, and if he can play them right. For the most part, Vault and S will be far away for survivors to get to, meaning the Hunter can attack many times in between traversing to nests. Also, Horde Spits and Survivor Sense Suppressors are very powerful on this map. If you're caught in the middle of nowhere with a Horde Spit stuck on you, you are in some real danger. And Survivor Suppressor is also dangerous because the Night Hunter will have access to so many paths and ways to attack you from unexpectedly. Certain spots can also hinder Survivor's buggies. Toxic Spit will impair the traction of the wheels and UV Suppressor will disable UV related pieces of equipment. Be very careful in the countryside. It may be a warm and nice place to be, but there are very sinister and dangerous parts of the countryside that you should be aware of. Now I feel this is a good spot to point out miscellaneous or odd pieces of info that could really help you out. Always stick together when you're on a team. Nothing is more infuriating when some dumbass runs way ahead to try and kill a nest, only for the Night Hunter to shut him down and cost the team a life. The survivor's function is best at a team. Don't disregard them. Also, be a good teammate in general. Help survivors when they're attacked. UV the hunter when their team can. Throw a flare down away from others to create safe zones. Stay away from unaffected survivors if you get a horde spit on you. Please be courteous to your teammates at all times. Set keybinds for yourself. Keybinds will help you swap between pieces of equipment and weapons faster than just cycling. This can help save human lives. Do not underestimate them. Chase fleeing night hunters when you can. If you can continue to injure or drain the energy of a night hunter, their healing process will be interrupted. This will force them to stay out of the fight longer, buying you and your team more time to destroy a nest. However, keep in mind that the game is about killing nests, not the hunter. While it is fun to get a cheeky death from above on a hunter, please just don't go out of your way to only kill a night hunter. If the night hunter retreats very far away, go close to the nest to destroy them. That's how you win the game. Don't go deeper into hunter territory to try and bully him. This could backfire greatly. Upgrade health kit efficiency, max HP, and health regeneration first when upgrading legendary skills. These three legendary skills are the only things that carry into nightmare mode, and every second counts. Heal when you can. Conserving medkits is not what you should be doing if you're playing Night Hunter. Do not get angry. Yes, I know. The Night Hunter can be cheap at times with his acid spit, tackle spam, ground pounding, UV heal, and UV suppressor. Yes, the Night Hunter is way too good for your skill level right now, and you shouldn't be fucking with an Apex. Trust me, I know. But try not to get angry. I know this is way easier said than done, but getting angry is playing into the Night Hunter's hands. The angrier you get, the more likely you will mess up more, causing the Night Hunter to get cheap kills on you. When the Hunter is UV blocking, keep your UV light on him at all times. If a Night Hunter isn't using a UV block to escape, he's most likely trying to hit you with a UV suppressor spit, or move in in an unpredictable way and try to pounce you at a weird and dumb angle. Keep your UV light on him constantly. This will save your ass. This tip goes double time if you're a night hunter who UV heals. Don't blink your UV light. If you blink your UV light, it'll actually drain the battery faster than if you just held it down constantly. Keep your actions varied. If you fall into a predictable pattern, the night hunter will catch on and will abuse this knowledge. Try to mix your gameplay up. Make many turns, detours, and go at different angles occasionally. This will make the Night Hunter have to keep guessing on not only where you're going, but how he can try to kill you based on the current environment. Also keep your movements random. Instead of walking into a hunter's ground pound and letting him hurt you and escape, make it look like you're going in, only to back out at the last second and fucking up his ground pound. This could turn the tide of battle in an instant. If you're using camouflage, don't run in the most predictable route to the next nest. Camo is to buy yourself time and to keep hidden from the beast. Do not be counterproductive with your camouflage. If a person is a cheater, don't humor them. Leave the game. Cheaters are really scummy, and they only want a reaction out of you. How can you tell if a hunter is cheating? Well, there are many, many cheats out there for dying light. Some common ones are infinite stamina, extra health, extra speed, extra jump height, and infinite spits. If they're a confirmed cheater, just leave. 
If you drop out of a game immediately, it won't count as a forfeit for you. The game rewards you for winning. Both Night Hunters and Survivors have a rank tied to them. The higher the rank, the more likely they're better at the game. Unless they boost it, of course. And if your rank is underdog or higher on the human side, you can start getting gold weapons for fighting Night Hunters. These can practically be any weapon in the game with a gold variant on it. Keep at it and you'll eventually be rewarded. Play on Nightmare Mode. While this sounds counterintuitive, it's actually better. At least, I think it is. Let me explain. One thing, medkits, despite healing over time, will actually heal more health overall when it's fully done. Also, this will let you carry healing over time while you're fighting, helping you heal off any damage that you take. Playing on Nightmare will also give you more survivor points and better weapon drops at the end of the game. Play as the other side of the quarantine. What I mean by this is, play as the Night Hunter. To know how your enemy works will put you miles ahead of them. Hell, if you've watched this guide up until now, you will be more knowledgeable on how to play the game, especially during Steam sales with an influx of new players joining. When the Night Hunter is far away or is dead, kill the most dangerous nest first. This mainly applies to the vaults will be protected by goons. To deal with goons, either throw firecrackers to distract him or wail into him with bullets and arrows until he dies. A goon can actually die from one crossbow bolt to the forehead or a few shotgun shells fired point blank at him. Then destroy the nest as soon as you can. If you ignore that particular vault long enough, the goon can actually respawn, causing you an unnecessary headache. Also, if you're with a team, vault nests die faster if each of you go to your own vault and kill them one by one. Try not to stack on top of another vault together, unless it's the last one remaining or it's the last nest. Find out who's the weakest link, quote unquote, of the team and protect them. While this sounds rather insulting to one particular player, this could simply mean that they're the least experienced, they have terrible lag, or generally just having a bad match. Hey, it happens to everybody. However, almost no Night Hunters will uphold an honor system of any kind and they will target them again and again. This is where you and hopefully your team will protect them at all costs. While I've noticed best works is you should travel in the shape of a circle or a triangle, often fairly far apart, but you can still cover each other, with the weak link, quote unquote, in the middle. They will be protected by up to three other teammates and will help ensure survival for everybody. Night Hunters fight dirty, and so should you. As I've already said, almost all Night Hunters will never uphold an honor system of any kind. They will spit asses on a down corpse, they will tackle spam, they will ground spam, they will UV heal, and they will scratch corpses. So if they act like this, so should you. Body block the hunter with your team so he can't weasel out of a bad situation. Treat the hunter like a pinball and have your team bully him to death with drop kicks. Throw flares as often as you can. Walk into a safe zone if shit hits the fan. Use your buggy all the time. Destroy nests if they aren't attacking. Use camouflage at your heart's content. Whatever you have to tip the scales in your favor. Diversify the team's equipment and playstyle. This mainly applies to friends and who you play with, but before a Night Hunter game, ask them how to they want to play and what pieces of equipment they should use. While you can run anything you want to, a good general solid idea is to have one person using firecrackers, two people with shields, and one person using any kind of potions that they like. This will help keep your team well rounded and prepared for a lot of situations. Also figure out battle tactics. Who's the best at death from above it? Who's the best at being a night hunter bait? Who's the best at destroying nests? Figure out who's best at what and utilize it. Hell, if you want to go the extra mile, have all your teammates dressed in the same pieces of costumes. This will help the night hunter more likely forget who is who and will be less prone to targeting one specific person. In conclusion, I've laid out all you need to know on how to fight the night hunter in dying light. Night Hunter is a very fun game mode, and Teclan adding Night Hunter to Dying Light to be a very random, at any moment type of game only keeps me and other players drawn to the game. I highly recommend you play Night Hunter often and do your best to win. I hope you learned a few new things or have a whole new perspective of the game mode. I can't wait to fight with or against you outside of the quarantine zone. Oh, and be on the lookout for a part 2 on how to become the Night Hunter himself and how you can strike fear into the remaining survivors and truly become the beast on the top of the food chain. Become the apex predator you were mutated to become.